Hello and welcome to Pittsburgh City Council's Post Agenda for Thursday, December 5th, 2019. My name is Kim Clark Baskin and I'm the Deputy City Clerk. With us today, we have our sign language interpreter, David Tatro. The following is a list of legislation up for discussion via roundtable by Pittsburgh City Council. An agenda item at the request of council members, Reverend Burgess and Councilman Daniel Lavelle. Bill number 2213, resolution establishing the city of Pittsburgh all in city's leadership forum. Bill number 2214, resolution recognizing racism as a public health crisis. And Bill number 2215, Resolution Establishing the All-In Cities Investment Fund. That concludes the reading of the legislation up for discussion via roundtable. Thank you for tuning in and have a great day. Good afternoon and welcome to Pittsburgh City Council. Um, we have tonight, this afternoon, a post agenda on the Pittsburgh Acts to Combat Racism legislation, which is three uh, bills um, that were introduced and sponsored by uh, Councilman Lavelle and myself and co-sponsored by President Bruce Krause. Uh, we are certainly joined today. I am uh, Reverend Key Burgess. I'm joined by Councilman Lavelle and President Krause. Now I want to um, inform everybody today is a post agenda meeting, which means that this is the time for us to frame the arguments and have the discussion. Um, there is an agenda out there and those people who are listed on the agenda have been selected to share mm -hmm. their insight. But tonight at mm -hmm. 6.30 at the Ebenezer Baptist Church, 2001 Wally Avenue at 6.30, Every single person who comes and wishes to speak will, given, will be given an opportunity. Um, some of you have signed up. Those who have signed up will be given three minutes. And those of you who have not signed up, depending on the, the, large, the size of the crowd, will get at least one minute, if not three minutes. And so if you are not, if you're here and you want to speak to the subject, council is coming to um, Ebenezer tonight. Um, and so please come. The sign up, the sign up phone number. By 3.30, you have time. The sign-up phone number is 412, and those of you who are watching at home, 412-255-2138. That's 412-255-2138, and you will be guaranteed three minutes. So please sign up, and you can go in the hall and call and sign up. And um, so we are grateful for everyone's participation. We have a number of guests. So the first, we're going to do this in three sections. We're having three panels, and so um, each panel will talk, and council will be able to ask them questions, and then the second panel and the third panel. So the first panel will be government representatives, the second panel will be the University of Pittsburgh researchers, and the third panel will be uh, selected community leaders. We're also uh, joined by Councilwoman Deborah Gross. We're thankful for her presence. And so the first uh, panel, if they would please come forward, is, um, um, along with myself, is Majestic Lane, uh, Luann Brink from the Allegheny County Health Department, and the members of the Pittsburgh Black elected officials. I've, I know Olivia Bennett's here, I know DeWitt Walton's here, and if you would come and take a seat at the table, we'd be grateful. While you're coming, we're going to ask, uh, Majestic, if you come down, you're gonna be first. If you come all the way down. And so if um, we're going to ask our clerk, if she would please uh, read um, the bills after that I will start the presentation conversation bill 2213 resolution establishing the city of Pittsburgh all in cities leadership forum bill 2214 resolution recognizing racism as a public health crisis and bill 2215 resolution establishing the all in cities investment fund thank you very much and so um, we're going to Kelly are you with me somewhere all right um, they've, they've gotten high technology on me with clickers instead of sitting at the table, right, and doing it remotely. And so I'm going to begin to at least have an opening statement 
about the legislation and what we're trying to suggest uh, today. Um, I was born and raised here in Pittsburgh. I have spent all of my professional life as a pastor, professor, and politician here in my hometown. I was married here and have raised my children here. I am a Pittsburgher through and through. I bleed black and gold. Yet numerous reports have documented the fact that Pittsburgh has a problem with institutional racism and its devastating effects upon its African-American residents. Despite this fact, I still love my city, and I also believe with my heart that Pittsburgh is greater than racism. In order to gain greater clarity, first we need an accurate understanding of racism. Racism is often viewed as an action performed by individuals. But even if we got rid of all America's prejudiced individuals, racism would still exist in the systems they built. Systematic racism, writer Janae Desmond Harris explains, refers to how racial disparities operate in major parts of United States society, the economy, politics, education, and more. Racism, in other words, isn't just someone using a racial slur. It's also the poor schooling in predominantly black and brown neighborhoods, the racial wealth gap, housing discrimination, mass incarceration, police killings of unarmed black and brown people, higher infant mortality rates for people of color, and unequal access to health care. It's becoming apparent that racism is a health crisis in the United States. Systematic racism is embedded in society and has a detrimental effect on the lives and health comes of people of color. Those who experience racial discrimination are more likely to suffer from chronic diseases and premature death. These health-related issues interact with and are reinforced by other products of systematic racism, such as income inequality, educational disparities, housing discrimination, mass incarceration, violence, unequal access to health care. Racism is a public health crisis because it risks the health and well-being of all citizens and causes destruction at a social and economic level. But racism is also killing African Americans right here in Pittsburgh and is an immediate public health crisis. America's most livable city is also the least livable city for African Americans. Recently, the City of Pittsburgh Gender and Equity Commission, whose author we have with us today, issued a report titled, Pittsburgh's Inequality Across Gender and Race. According to its findings, Pittsburgh's black residents could move to almost any other U.S. city of comparable size and have a better quality of life. The report found that compared to those in similar cities, black women in Pittsburgh face higher rates of maternal mortality and poverty, along with lower rates of employment and college readiness. Black men face higher rates of occupational segregation, homicide, cancer, and cardiovascular disease. In subsequent interviews, Junia Howe, a University of Pittsburgh sociologist who worked on the report said, our report empirically validated that Pittsburgh's racism is not only alive and well, but more extreme than most cities. Earlier this year, the city's Pittsburgh, the city of Pittsburgh passed legislation declaring itself an all-in city. Department heads will soon have to submit reports detailing how the budgetary decisions further equity within city government and an internal equity implementation team is being established. Moreover, city council now has created and filled a full-time equity policy analyst position which helps to shepherd this work throughout the city government and also engages with the public including the all-in Pittsburgh Coalition. This work is being fast-tracked as the city is now receiving training from GEAR, Government Alliance on Race and Equity, to better embed racial equity within city government operations and decision-making. As an all-in city, we, City Council, and the Mayor's Office will continue the work of racial justice, equity, and inclusion. We will continue to coordinate government activities as the city and its authorities implement the five-point agenda in the equitable development, the path to an all-in Pittsburgh. One, raise the bar for new development. Two, make all neighborhoods healthy communities of opportunity. Three, expand unemployment, employment and business opportunity, business ownership opportunities. Four, embed racial equity throughout Pittsburgh's institutions and businesses. And five, build community power, voice, and capacity. For Pittsburgh to be a livable city, for all, 
we must come together and prioritize racial justice and racial reconciliation. Today, we begin this important conversation about three additional pieces of legislation, of racial justice legislation, as part of the all-in cities agenda. One, declaring racism as a public health crisis in Pittsburgh. Two, establishing an all-in cities leadership policy council to coordinate the city's response to the crisis. And three, establishing an all-in cities capital fund to reduce racism's harmful effect in Pittsburgh's African-American communities. In conclusion, it is clear that racism is a public health crisis in the United States and an immediate and urgent crisis here in Pittsburgh. But I believe our country is greater than racism. I believe our city is greater than racism, and I believe that this city council is greater than racism. Following the lead of Milwaukee and Madison, Wisconsin, we can become one of the first cities in the country to declare racism as a public health crisis. So with the passage of the proposed legislation, we begin to publicly confront racism as a public health crisis, coordinate the city's responses to the problem of racism, and commit sufficient resources to eradicate racism. As the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said, the prescription for the cure rests with an accurate diagnosis of the disease. And so first up, our first panel, um, we have um, government officials. We are joined by Majestic Lane, the um, Director of the Office of Equity, City of Pittsburgh, Luann Brink for Allegheny County Health Department, and two of the six uh, officials of the Pittsburgh Block elected, uh, three, okay, three of the uh, Pittsburgh Block <laughs> elected officials uh, coalition. All right, we will start with Majestic Lane, then go to Luann Brink, and then uh, members of the Block elected four officials, and they will give their two to three minute remarks. We are also joined with us by Councilwoman Teresa Smith and the Honorable Councilman Anthony Calcio. Thank you, um, and thank you to members of council uh, for allowing me to come speak. Uh, Majestic Lane, Deputy Chief of Staff and Chief Equity Officer for Mayor Peduto. And um, just wanted to talk a little bit around some of the work and some of the thoughts that go into some of the work that we're doing. Um, racial equity is often defined as when one's race is not a stand-in for quality of life or standard of living. Using that definition, decades of data have shown that the city of Pittsburgh, like most other American cities, has a ways to go in order for that to become our reality. As public servants, we are compelled to be concerned with the health, safety, and welfare of every citizen. So looking at public health through a racial lens is a sensible and important way to make sure we're building a city in which everyone can live, survive, and flourish. We know that even when you account for class and education, there are striking disparities in life expectancy and quality of life for black people in the city of Pittsburgh. So discussions like this are sorely needed. In May of 2019, Mayor Peduto created the Office of Equity, the fifth in the country, in order to work on issues of equity around race, class, gender, sexual orientation, and ability amongst other issues. Our goal is to break down the silos that so frequently limit our ability to break down structural barriers and provide pathways to access, opportunity, as well as equal outcomes. We have become a member of GARE, which is the Government Alliance for Racial Equity, in order to identify internal and external structural barriers to racial equity. Over 100 of our employees from 13 departments and authorities have underwent a two-day training on racial equity in government and how to identify potential disparities in decisions around policies and budgets. We've also been in discussion with county and state officials about how we can scale our efforts beyond city, explicit city responsibilities. And so I just wanted to take a moment to kind of really talk about how we see this, this work happening. And we see this work happening in all components of city government right because we you know we know that people don't live in silos they don't live in isolation and the challenges that people have are not in isolation so in order for us to really get to resolve some of these challenges and make sure that race is not a stand-in for quality of life we all have to work together as, as well as create a broader vision um, I salute the work of, of looking at the legislations. I also I think want to add the role and importance of looking at youth and children um, in this particular conversation because we know many of these challenges can be found at very young ages and at spaces where we can start to resolve them and also underscore the importance of intersectionality because we understand that people 
have various identities and various lives, and we know that you often find a lot of disparities around not only race, but also gender, as we saw in the report, sexual orientation, and a variety of, uh, of intersections. So we want to make sure that we always are asserting and affirming that so that we can work to make sure um, everyone is dealt with. In particular, we've been looking at some of the homelessness around some of the LGBTQIA communities and looking at the huge disparities. Those are things that sometimes don't come to bear in these conversations, but are examples of public, explicit public health challenges that people are having. This really cuts to the core of what is happening with people's lives. And, and reports, they mean one thing, documents mean one thing, but we have to cut to the core of how are people living? What are people experiencing? What are people going through? And what is not allowing people to survive, thrive, and flourish in our neighborhoods? And I know that the administration as well as the council is willing and will continue to work together to make sure that this is truly a city for all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do have a presentation, so I can, I can switch that. Oh. More. Um, so I, my name is Luann Brink and I'm the chief epidemiologist at the Allegheny County Health Department. So I'm really here to just put some numbers behind um, the, uh, the, the statements that you guys have made and uh, really highlighting some of the largest disparities that and really just to highlight some of the um, more striking disparities that we encounter and report on uh, from the health department perspective. Um, so. Just a few facts, racial disparities persist for many health outcomes among Allegheny County, including the city of Pittsburgh residents. Um, just off the cuff, any one of these outcomes I probably could have talked about for an hour. So I'll be just doing a highlight, not unpacking any of the causes for any of these. We realize that not all Allegheny County residents have an equal opportunity to live long and healthy lives, and that these inequities increase the risk of poor health outcomes among many of our non-white populations. Social determinants of health are factors where we live, work, and play that impact the health and well-being, and these factors encompass what we need to live as healthily as possible. The following data reflect racial or geographic disparities for select health outcomes and social factors. And again, this is not a complete assessment. So first, we're, we would look at all-cause mortality. These are age-adjusted um, mortality rates. The gray line at the top represents the mortality rate for black males from 1970 through 2017, where our, our data is available. Um, Below that are white males, next comes uh, black females, and finally white females have the lowest um, all-cause mortality rate. Median age at death, you can say, see that among um, white females have the highest age at death at 84 years in Allegheny County, that was in 2016. Next come white males at 76, then black females at age 72 at an average age at death, and then we have black males at age 65 as the average age at death. The age-adjusted mortality rates by race, this is by cause. You can see the primary cause of death in Allegheny County is diseases of the heart. That disparity is almost twofold between African Americans and our white population. There's disparities in many of these. We have a full um, mortality report that covers these. Even cancer, which is our second leading cause of death, there is a disparity. But if you fall down to the to the bottom of the list, the, the last primary cause of death, which is assault or homicide. We can see the racial disparity there. The orange bar represents um, black members of the community, and the blue bar represents white members of the community. The number of homicides uh, between in the five years between 2014 and 2018, you can see there were 553 total. 420 of those were among uh, black members of our community, and 30% of all homicides occurred among black males aged 15 to 24. The age adjusted death rate due to HIV is another large disparity. It's over sixfold, with 3.6 .6 per 100,000 among our black population to 0.5 per 100,000 in our white population. Overall, that's less than one. We have cancer. You can see um, within our county, um, where the rates are higher than the uh, county overall are in the pink areas. We can see those are in some of our primarily African-American areas, including Homewood, the Hill District, the North Side, and then in the Mon Valley. Adults with high blood pressure within the city of Pittsburgh. 
We can see uh, the darkest areas are again Homewood, the Hill District, and some on the north side and down in Hazelwood, down on the river. Adults with diabetes, really the same pattern. Elevated blood lead levels that occurred in the past four years. Again, we're looking at Homewood, we're looking at Hazelwood, and the north side. And those represent um, children with elevated levels among all those tested. Those, those numbers are between 6% and 16%. And just to unpack it a little bit, we'll talk about some social factors. Median household income um, among the <coughs> Total population of Allegheny County, that is 56,000. Among the black population, that's just over 30,000. Percentage living poverty. 45% of um, black children are living in poverty compared to 8.7% of, of white children. Families living in poverty, that's nearly 30% for the black population compared to 5% for the white population. And among seniors, it's a less striking disparity, but still there. Over double, in fact. 17% of our black uh, seniors are living in poverty. Most of our white and black members of Allegheny County have um, achieved a high school education, but there is a pretty big disparity among those who have finished college. 41% of white people have and 20% of black people have. This is data from our... Um, behavioral risk factor survey that we conducted about three years ago. This represented a question as to whether the, the surveyed people were worried or stressed about not having enough money to buy nutritious meals. Among black respondents, that was 14%. Among white respondents, that was 7%. They were stressed about not being able to buy food. Uh, as far as making the mortgage, nearly a quarter of our black population who answered the survey were worried or stressed about having enough money to pay the rent or mortgage compared to about 12% of the white population. Healthcare access, with I know, which I know Reverend Burgess uh, addressed. Again, do, in that same survey, 12% uh, of people, uh, black population did not have health insurance. And more interestingly, 14% um, of the black population said they couldn't get to care in the past year due to high cost. And that's compared to 8% of the white population. Most of these are about double. Our uninsured adults, and this is, uh, this is census data. Um, again, you can see the same uh, African-American areas are lighting up in Homewood, the Hill District, and on the north side, and a bit in Hazelwood as well. So thank you for your time and letting me present these numbers to you. Thank you very much. And I don't have a hard copy on me, but I'd be happy to share. Mm -hmm. Of course. Right. Copy. Thanks. So we're going to have a response from um, the three of the five black elected officials or anything that they would like to say. Hi, I'm Liv Bennett. I am the incoming county council person for District 13. Um, my remarks are just that one um, minor more of making sure that we're including certain things um, as Ms. Brink went through her her presentation there were some things that were highlighted for me um, one the college and we have these universities here um, and the the gap between finishing school or, or college degrees and how that translates tangibly in our universities here that we have in the city. Um, also wage gap and environmental justice also are very big factors in African American communities and that and also, we need to make sure that we're including gender when we are speaking about this, because in the bill itself, as I read it, just says African American, but as the gender equity report stated, black women specifically are, are, um, are the most impacted by these disparities. So those are just things that I wanted to highlight, it, highlight um, in my statements, and I will pass. Thank you, Councilman Burgess, Councilman Lavelle, for authoring this piece of legislation. It is clear to me that we are experiencing a crisis. When we, as the Pittsburgh Black elected officials, began our work four years ago, 
we looked at the areas of housing, education, business opportunities, employment, family outcomes, and public safety. And clearly, in all of the work that has been presented today, demonstrates by leaps and bounds that we are, we are in a crisis. Today, um, the Institute of Politics at the University of Pittsburgh is hosting a forum dealing with mass incarceration and its impact. In New York City, there was um, Rikers Island is being closed, and four regional jails are being established to, to address the inequities that emerged from Rikers. Here in, here in Allegheny County, we spend 97 plus million dollars a year on the Allegheny County Jail. We spend 54 million dollars a year on the Schumann Center. We have to address the real inequities of mass incarceration. We have to issue, we have to really have a conversation with the judicial system on bail, on, uh, on locking people up unreasonably, and find alternative strategies to allow people to go to work, to feed their families, to maintain jobs. Because every time somebody gets locked up and, it stay, and stays there for several days, they lose their job, which places a greater burden on the city and all the services that we provide. Clearly, there has to be a better way. In terms of the issue of gender equity, we all know that women earn less money than men, and black women earn even less money. So we really have to begin to attack those core kinds of issues. And we have to attack it in a myriad of ways. We have to deal with the transportation inequities. Most jobs are not on the bus line, but for those who are, they don't, they don't adequately address the issue of African-American females. We have to address the issue of child care and the impact of the cliff effect. So how can we um, really reasonably expect a woman who has <coughs> several children to be able to go to work and pay for child care? It doesn't work. We have to find a better way. We have to tackle these issues by dealing with transportation. We have to deal with it in child care. We have to deal with the education system in a more comprehensive and progressive manner. We have work to do. Thank you for introducing this legislation. I stand willing and ready to work with you on all of these issues to bring about fundamental progress and change. Thank you. First of all, um, Daniel, Ricky, thank you for bringing this legislation forward. I want to thank everybody on city council, everybody in the mayor's office for addressing this issue. Um, but for me, this issue is nothing new. What we discuss in here today has been in every report for the last 30 years. It may be said different, it may look different, but the same thing that we're discussing today is the same issues that we've been discussing when it comes to the African American community for the last 30 years. There's nothing new about this report at all. The catch is, is what we gonna do? Because what we do determines our future. And so right now, I need to say to my community that regardless of every report that's come out that has been derogatory in nature about the plight of the African American, we are no liability, but we are an asset in this city. And I want you to see yourself as an asset every single day. Because we never talk about how we got here. The institutional racism that we had to go through to get to where we are today. None of this happened by accident. And so therefore, I need you to understand that we can come out of it. The introduction of this legislation today is great. 
But it means nothing if we don't put resources behind it. It means nothing if we don't do affordable housing. It means nothing if we don't do workforce development. It means nothing if we don't connect our community to the job market that is growing in the city of Pittsburgh right now, in Allegheny County right now. You want to give us opportunity, create the access. Whenever we've had access and opportunity, we've done one thing. We've always changed the conditions of our community. Where's the report that talks about black assets and how do we build these black assets so that we can show integration and equality in our communities? Now let's really talk about it. Let's talk about the steering and how we did home ownership back in the day. The fact that we lack affordable housing right now. Let's talk about what it takes to move Pittsburgh forward. We cannot be the most livable city until African Americans get a piece of the pie. So we are grateful. Again. We are grateful. We are grateful for it. So I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you too. I need you. I got it. So, you know, I know two days before the day, 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 how am I going to prepare for how am I going to organize the people who are concerned when I only knew two days ago? Okay, but I got that. I got bills to pay. Listen, y'all want to hear me. They want to hear you, but listen, what you think? So, listen, 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 list
method to look at livability, and I'll talk a little bit about that today, um, but that is the other reason that I'm here today. So I actually want to start, um, being, being a scholar, I want to start with a few definitions. Um, so I am using the slides. If you want to look at them, these first few ones won't be as helpful, but in a few minutes I will be using graphs as well. Um, so just to clarify, um, I want to take us quickly back in history. Uh, so the word race was brought into English actually from Spanish in the 1500s. Um, and the word originally was a word to distinguish, in Spanish it was a word to distinguish different animals for breeding. Um, and it always was hierarchical. Um, and it always had condensations of who could mix with who. And so when that word was brought into English, it carried over those same condensation, con that's not how you say the word, <laughs> same meanings. Um, and those meanings held. And it was in the 1500s when uh, it was the rise of colonialism, and it wasn't a kind of random or neutral division of human groups, but it was a socially constructed div division that perpetually asserted that those who are white and who's been classified as white has changed over time, but that category has always received um, the, the kind of honorable assumptions of their morality as well as the most resources. The word racism, um, originally and historically, was a word that was to denote the racial inequality that was because of that racial hierarchy. It actually originally um, had no condensations of individual actions at all. Instead, it was much more of a relationship directly um, using or being able to articulate the racial inequality that was in the society. The word became started to be used after World War II as also a word that we used individually, and that is not by happenstance. Um, the reason that we started to use that word also individually was because it was a way of distinguishing between what was going on uh, or how we were punishing the Holocaust and justifying that as different than what we are doing to Jim Crow South and our black population in the South to what we did to our Japanese Americans in, incarcer in incarceration camps during the war and what we are and continue to do to our indigenous populations in reser reservations. And so the word, the changing in that word also became a legal mo movement where then we were le legating Ligating, ligating, I don't know if I said it right. <laughs> um, we were making into law that what was illegal was intent, was your, your um, desire to hurt someone else. But scholars continue to maintain that the initial origin of that word is about the inequality of resources itself and the ability and the perpetuation of, again, that white category having those most, most of those resources. So when we say that word and when I'm using that word, I do not mean intent. I do and I do not mean individual actions, I mean that our society continues to have striking racial inequality. And again, that doesn't mean every single individual is, has more if you are identified as white than every single individual who is identified as a person of color, but as a group, that is the inequity we see. So given that, um, just to put some visual numbers behind that inequity, on the national level, this is coming from PSID data and it's data on wealth. So <coughs> sociologists define wealth, also known as net worth, as the uh, kind of the ad uh, summation of all your assets minus your debt. And what I want you to notice here is the stark inequality both across race and gender as well as referenced in the first panel. Particularly, um, this amaze or just really sad inequality between white men and black women. Black women, on average, in our country, have four hundred dollars in net wealth or uh, net worth or wealth, depending on which word you want to use. That's eighty-five times smaller than white men in our country. In Pittsburgh, we see similar inequalities across income. In fact, if we do the cent to dollar that we often use to talk about income inequality, white women in Pittsburgh make 78 cents to the white man's dollar. That's compared to white, or excuse me, black men who make 58 cents and black women who make only 54 cents. Um, Pittsburgh's poverty, which is a measure defined by the federal government that's a combination of household income, also incorporates how many people are living in that house. We see similar inequalities. In fact, back, um, I'm realizing I forgot my water. <laughs> my, my mouth is getting so dry. <laughs> if you could, that would be amazing. Thank you. Um, Pittsburgh poverty, uh, or from Richard, uh, Pittsburgh's poverty is three times higher among black women compared to their white women counterparts. This inequality is even more stark among our children. Thank you so much. When you talk fast, you have to drink water, apparently. <laughs> Among our children, our black boys 
are six times more likely to be in poverty than our white boys. This inequality is also seen across bachelor's degrees as we were just denoting. And all these inequalities then have stark impacts on health, particularly from the very beginning of health, so like fetal mortality, where black women are to, in Pittsburgh are two times more likely to lose their babies than white women, all the way up to old age where we see these same patterns play out, as well as cardiovascular disease and cancer, which we just heard about in the last panel. So this, as we, as we were just saying, is something we know. It's, it's been here. It's not new. Um, but I, there are four reasons that we push back on doing anything about this that I often hear here in Pittsburgh in particular. So the first is that it's getting better. So hold off, don't do anything dramatic. Racial inequality is getting better. We should just keep doing what we're doing. The second is that this is a national phenomenon, so there's not much that a city level intervention could do. The third is that it's more about effort or what the black population is doing than any kind of quote unquote discrimination. And the first is the problem isn't really fixable. So I wanna address each of these in kind. So first, is it getting better? I'm going to show national data for a second for this. I'm going to divide it again because this manifests differently in men and women. Um, for men, uh, in 1980, uh, the inequality between white men and black men was much smaller than the inequality we now see in 2017. Now, granted, and this is straight dollars, so it's not accounting for inflation. Everyone's income's gone up. But I want you to note that inequality is now three times larger than it was in 1980. When we look at women's income, um, generally their income is smaller, which we already just discussed. But even more dramatic, the inequality has now 10 times larger in 2017 between white women and black women than it was in 1980. Similarly, we see these inequalities between bachelor's degrees also grow. Thus, I would argue that it's not getting better, and using that rhetoric is actually perpetuating the very notions of racism and white supremacy because it insinuates that people shouldn't be calling to attention the inequality that is not only persisting, but in various cases getting worse. The second piece I want to talk about is this national argument. Is it just national? And this is where the report um, in which I am the lead author and created this new methodology for comes into play. So part of our and mine in particular vision in doing this report was to put Pittsburgh in context with other cities. It's one thing to talk about this nationally. It's another thing to think about what can we do specifically as a city. Also, as we've already noted, um, it's, it was commissioned by the Gender Equity Commission, and their vision and legislation is intersectional. And thus, we were looking both at gender and race. Given limitations of the data, as many of you know, we were unable to look at the full spectrum of gender, but were restricted be, to a male-female dichotomy. Similarly, given the restrictions of governmental data, we were unable to look at these intersections across all of the racial groups that the government uh, collects data on, and thus we had to ma we made the decision to collapse the groups we couldn't get individual data on into a category and create a our own acronym. So if you've seen that and wondered what was going on, um, those are the reasons. And this thus is the categories we're looking at. So as I already mentioned, we created a new method to compare across, and we are comparing Pittsburgh residents to comparable cities like Cincinnati, Cleveland, Baltimore, Buffalo, Detroit, Louisville, in fact, 89 other demographically comparable cities. And e for each of these groups, so for white men, we're comparing Pittsburgh's white men to white men in other cities, Pittsburgh's white women to white women in other cities, et cetera. By doing this, we are able to put Pittsburgh in perspective both in rank, meaning how Pittsburgh compares, but also we're looking at variability. And that's actually really important for the policy side, so I'm going to explain that slightly so that you all understand the policy implications of it. And I'm going to take a drink first. So to use an example, if we were looking at income, these are made up numbers, but rank would just be where Pittsburgh is compared to other cities. But if you want to look at those numbers for a second, I'm going to change them. And I want you to notice how these numbers, there's a lot less variability than the numbers I showed at first. Why that's important is because if there's not much variability, those factors are likely due to national um, phenomenon. But if there's a lot of variability between cities, especially when it comes to inequality, that has to do often with local factors. Not necessarily entirely, but that is a way to start paying attention to what's going on. So this method we came up does that. This is the income version, and this is the visualization of that method. Um, just to explain, the diamonds are Pittsburgh. Um, the middle line is the middle of all the cities that we're comparing. Everything to the right 
are cities that have above livability, so this is income, so higher income than the quote-unquote average city, and all the cities to the left would be the inverse of that. The length of the line is the variability, so is that sense of how much does this compare or differ between cities. And specifically, the distance between here is this ranking that helps us identify where Pittsburgh's strengths are, as well as, where, as, well as areas where we need improvement. So we looked across various components, and I'm not going to go through everything, but I just want to hit a few highlights that shows um, that <laughs> Pittsburgh is, is different um, in some ways than the national context. So I already showed the fetal mortality, but I want to put in context that compared to other cities, black women, compared to black women in other cities, have much higher fetal mortality here in Pittsburgh than other places. Similarly, with the adult mortality that I already showed, you see those same patterns happen once again, as well as the cardiovascular disease, as well as cancer. So I'm, I'm noting that the diamonds are all the way to the left, and thus many cities are doing better on these outcomes, for, for, particularly for our black population than Pittsburgh. Um, poverty is a similar story, particularly for our child poverty. And in fact, when we put all this together, the factors that are most striking um, using this method come down to black women's maternal mortality, black women's employment and poverty, black men's occupational segregation, black men's homicide, and black men's cancer and heart disease. All the, the full list um, you can see in the report, and it's, it's not particularly um, by race, but it is very notable that those are the top five and speak to, again, this is not just a national problem. It is a national problem, but there are things going on in Pittsburgh that we need to deal with. Okay, the third piece, this effort um, that it's uh, because something is lacking, and I, I love the language that was being used in the first panel, um, that the language around this often ignores the amazing assets and the resilience in the black community. And so the other thing that we are able to do in the report is cross um, compare things to demonstrate how, for example, with the um, outcomes for babies all across all the raci racial groups in Pittsburgh, women are equally likely to seek uh, prenatal care. In fact, they're more likely than their counterparts in many other cities. They're more, or they're, excuse me, they're less likely, because we're inverting it here, to have various um, uh, conditions during pregnancy, yet black women are three, th still three times more likely than their white women counterparts here in Pittsburgh to have babies ex of extremely low birth weight, and that is even true when you just look at college-educated women, and again, they fall below their black women counterparts in other cities. This is also true for other abnormal conditions, etc. at birth. The, one of the most striking differences is, again, um, which we've, which has gotten a lot of press, is the maternal mortality, where black women in Pittsburgh fall far below their black women counterparts in other cities. Bachelor's degrees. Okay, so sorry, I'm, I'm trying to go quickly, and then I realized I didn't make my point there. So my point there is it's not that people aren't getting health care, but other conditions that are uh, at play there, and I'm sure my colleagues will fill that in more. The same kind of story is happening with bachelor's degrees. So yes, as I already noted, there's inequality in bachelor's degrees, but actually compared to other cities, um, we are doing fairly not as poorly. Um, with our bachelor's degrees, meaning that we are more average for bachelor's degrees amongst the black population in Pittsburgh than other cities. Yet, that's not true with employment. So if you haven't ever looked at the national story, um, this doesn't look as striking to you, but nationally, black women are the most likely to be employed, and that's not true in Pittsburgh. And so when you put that in context with these other cities, you see that black women fall far below their black women counterparts in other cities as far as their employment. So putting that in context, it's not because they don't have bachelors, it's because they're not getting jobs here. But they're more likely to be actively looking for jobs than their white counterparts. Similarly, another example of this from the report is black women are the least likely to be enrolled or like be asked by teachers, for example, to be enrolled in middle school algebra. But when they are enrolled, they're more likely than their white boy counterparts to pass the class. So it's not um, a lack of intelligence, not a lack of effort, it's not a lack of assets, but a lack of opportunities. The same patterns are happening in even more dramatic ways with our gifted and talented programs. So in short, I'm saying all this to say it's not, again, and it's not the effort or the assets or the ability. So finally, the fixable question. And for this, I'm going to move slightly um, into a little bit more of my expertise, um, and then I will pass it on to my colleagues who will speak more on the health piece.
So there are many mechanisms that drive this, and we have to think about those mechanisms in order to think about policies. So some are historical inequalities. Many times we think about microaggressions and biases, and those are at play, but also the contemporary policies. So this is true across things like housing, jobs, and schools, and healthcare. And I'm going to focus for a second on housing, because that is more of what I do. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, again, this was referenced, but I want to give some historical context to it. Um, in 1929, the stark market crash, um, leading to a new administration and the rise and election of FDR, who of course put in the New Deal, and part of that was a housing administration. And central to that, his vision was to, in order to recover from the economic crisis, in order to really restore a middle class, was to make home ownership a way not only that people could access homes, but a way to accumulate wealth. <coughs> Thank you. I needed another drink of water. Um, thanks for your patience. Um, and so as part of that, they did a radical thing and they changed what historically been mortgages, which were only three to five years, to be on average 30 years. And as part of that, they reduced down payments. And so for the first time in history, really around the world, people who are quote unquote middle class could afford homes. But in order to do that, they had to incentivize banks to give those mortgages. So the federal government decided to insure those mortgages, but they didn't want to insure the mortgages without having a way to know that people were actually evaluating those houses correctly. And so that is when the housing appraisal industry was institutionalized that didn't really exist before that and in collaboration with Hulk they actually decided that they were going to appraise houses as well as give mortgages based on neighborhoods and so this is the redlining map um, or the, that's what we colloquially call it but the map made by our federal government to decide how worthy neighborhoods in Pittsburgh were um, you will notice that if you know the demographics of Pittsburgh today or historically, you can see that this map that went from green as the most desirable neighborhoods to blue to yellow to red, there is a racial order here. And in fact, it has been well documented in historical documents that our federal government made these definitions by both race and class and created a system where they evaluated homes based on the racial composition of the neighborhood. This was in place, or because this was in place, it enabled wealth accumulation among our white population across our nation, and here in Pittsburgh, it also made differential impacts on public schools, public transit, stores, employment, you name it. It was in place until a series of four legislative acts in the late 60s and early 70s, and was formally outlawed in 1977 with the Community Reinvestment Act. At that point, um, what had been happening was that the appraisal energy in industry, excuse me, would use these maps in collection with what, what they called comps. And so comps, if you know, are when they look at comparable houses in order to determine the evaluation of a home. So that um, took place in 1977. So I'm going to use data starting in 1980. So right after that, you can see that this is just purely descriptive data in the US. Um, homes in white neighborhoods were worth over twice that. Um, in communities of color. Over time, these have increased, but the inequality, much like the other inequalities we have seen, has also increased. In fact, the inequality is twice as much now as it was in 1980. Beckoning the question, if we've outlawed redlining, why is this not only in, in continuing, but increasing? So part of it is this comp pr process. So as I mentioned, an appraiser will pick homes, ideally in the same neighborhood, that are similar to define, to, to define how much the house should be. They can pick houses in other neighborhoods, but they rarely, rarely do that because of the history and the institutionalization of the comparable house program. So when people um, justify this inequality, they say, well, it's because of the historical legacy that there's differences in house quality because of socioeconomic inequality, and they're actually just picking houses based on that. It's because of real estate demand, or maybe also it has to do with current temporary appraisers. And a series of models, um, <coughs> excuse me, in two papers that my co-authors and I have worked at, we've actually held all those things constant. So looked at, thank you guys, sorry. Um, so here, you can pour it back in here. We don't have to use cups. Um, so we've actually been able to hold constant, so statistically constant things about home quality, neighborhoods, schools, et cetera. 
And so that's the descriptive math. If we hold all those things constant, we can make projections if we're looking at the same two houses, and these are the lines. In fact, when we hold those things constant, there's even more stark inequality. If we look at just how much homes have accumulated, so now I'm holding everything constant, so similar size homes with similar uh, community, or public schools, similar socioeconomic demographics, et cetera, those in white neighborhoods have accumulated in wealth $266,000 worth homes in community of color have only accumulated $7,000 from 1980 to today. This is not adjusted for inflation. This is in real dollars. This is descriptive from our entire nation and is going on here in Pittsburgh. In, in fact, if, so that right there is wealth inequality, that's school inequality, that's all sorts of things that are affecting everything else that uh, the report that I was mentioning and the things we were talking about today. But one more thing I want to mention because it's policy relevant is we also look at how exact same homes, exact same neighborhoods change over time if the racial demographics of those neighborhoods are changing. And we show that as neighborhoods become white, not just we're historically white, but the appraisal values of those homes increase. And the inverse happens when communities become more black and Latinx, um, which is the particular just, or categorization that we can use for these particular models, showing that if, um, <laughs> I heard someone say gentrification, and absolutely, that, that is part of what's going on, right? So showing that it's not just about throwing um, resources at communities, but that the very mechanisms that we use to evaluate communities are still race, and because of that, no matter where we, no matter how we invest in particular places, if we're displacing people, we're perpetuating these inequalities. Um, so this lar these larger policies and systems are ones um, that I think that the council here, um, Wants, wants to care about and we want to think about how to address and these, and these various mechanisms outside of housing. So I would argue that um, this is actually an example because it's actually a very specific policy about how we evaluate housing. And I know it might feel far afield, but it's what I do. And I think there are similar arguments to be made for employment and healthcare, et cetera, that these things are not just non vexable So in, in fact, it's not getting better. It's persisting or getting worse. It's not just national. It's Pittsburgh. It's not just people's effort, but it's opportunity hoarding of the white population and a lack of being willing to think critically about how our historical inequalities are perpetuating what we see today, and I would argue it is also fixable in things that we need to address. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Mingus? Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to share today, and thank you for our panelists as well and those who spoke before me. My name is Dara Mendez. I'm currently an assistant professor of epidemiology at the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health. And before I deliver my statement, I want to mention that I'm not here to speak on behalf of the university, but to offer my expert um, opinion as someone has been leading public health research and practice for over 15 years. The field of public health specifically is concerned with promoting and protecting the health of populations using science, research, policy, and practice. My specific work focuses on the effects of racism, sexism, and other forms of oppression on health equity and health outcomes related to pregnancy, birth, and women's health. And in addition to my professional career on this issue, I was born and raised here in Pittsburgh. I lived in Mill Valley and Penn Hills for a very short part of my younger years, but spent the majority of my formative years in the Lincoln Larmer area of what I affectionately call Celebrity or East Liberty, East Liberty not the rebranded East End it is sometimes referred to today. We lived on Lincoln Avenue. The row houses where I grew up are all gone except for one remaining house, which is actually the one I lived in. I mention this all because not only I, did I dedicate my professional career to this issue, but I have lived experience. I lived in an area that experienced disinvestment, in schools that were disinvested in, where black individuals and specifically my peers were suspended and imprisoned and had limited employment opportunities. But I also come from a family line of brave, bril brilliant black people who migrated north from the south to work in the steel industry here in Pittsburgh and make a new way for their families. Some of those same families who experienced displacement and what Dr. Mindy Fully Love has called root shock, the traumatic stress and reaction to the loss and disruption of one's ecosystem, their neighborhood, for example. And in her book, Root Shock, she discusses the displacement due to urban renewal policies in the 1950s and 60s that specifically targeted black communities, where she cites displacement of black families in the Hill District and the lasting effects on, what, um, on health um, and well-being and what we've seen today. My work in this area 
specifically started in college at Spelman, where I was working on issues around gender racism and pregnancy outcomes under um, black women scholars who were actually leading some of the first to coin racism as a public health issue. And I wanna raise their names. Scholars such as Drs. Diane Riley, Mona Phillips, and Fleeta Jackson. And in this initial work, I was struck by the early studies that demonstrated that even at levels of education that were meant to be protective, such as having a college education, black birthing people, so meaning someone who may identify as a woman, but also non-binary or gender non-conforming people who give birth, were with a college education were two times as likely to have an infant death compared to their white counterparts. And these same um, folks who had a college education were more likely to have an infant death compared to their white counterparts without a high school diploma. So this early work influenced my career trajectory. I found that black women in particular experienced extreme burden of gender racism. What Dr. Philomena Essett defines as gender racism or sexism and racism are so intertwined, quote, and combined under certain conditions into one hybrid phenomenon. This results in oppression not explained by racism and sexism alone. From the work of Dr. Jackson and my own early work, not only did women experience gender racism, but these experiences were not just a specific, quote, incident, but a part of a, quote, historically created racial construction and structural reality. From this work, we also found that the stress and discrimination was prevalent in the workplace and with respect to caring for children. So in other words, the various institutions in which women and birthing people were coming into contact with on a daily basis had a detrimental effect on their health. So with the post-secondary education I received outside of Pittsburgh, which included um, a PhD in, um, and master's in um, maternal child health and epidemiology, I had the opportunity to first come back home in 2009 to address many of the issues I had been working on in other cities. And now actively conduct work with collaborators such as Jada Sherrill, who will speak a little bit later, CEO of Healthy Start, Alicia Tucker, Danae Wilson from the Maternal Child Health Division and leaders of the Infant Mortality Collaborative in which I serve, and Latasha Mays from New Voices for Reproductive Justice. I highlight their names because these are leading folks who are doing this work on racism, oppression, and gender racism as important public health issues, using an intersectional lens, reproductive justice, and equity frameworks. For example, the Infant Mortality Collaborative in which I serve as an executive member held a summit in 2018 that addressed racism as a public health issue, especially regarding inequities in infant mortality and maternal and infant health in general. And the IMC continues to apply equity frameworks, root cause analysis, and undoing racism and systems of oppression methods and approaches in our work. As we heard from um, some of the speakers, or at least one, and we'll hear, um, um, from Dr. Macero and from Ms. Cheryl, um, that these inequities in health are very well documented. Um, this includes specific inequities right here in our county. Black women and birthing people are four times as likely to have a pregnancy or a pregnancy-associated death, and three times as likely to have an infant death. In addition to mortality, there's racial inequities in morbidity, such, such as pregnancy-related hypertension, postpartum depression, and preterm birth, just to name a few. Recognizing and naming racism as a public health crisis is a critical first step in dismantling structures and systems of oppression that not only he, um, impede health and well-being, but are related to schooling, education, food systems, housing, employment, just to name a few. Geographer um, Dr. Ruth Wilson Gilmore's definition of racism points out that it's state sanctioned, that it's not by accident, and it could be extra legal, meaning it may not be legal, um, have, have a law attached to it, but it's a production and exploitation leading to vulnerability and premature death. Dr. Kamara Jones, prominent um, scholar and former president of the American Public Health Association, which an association <coughs> I belong to, which also has put uh, racism as a public health issue on a map, um, talks about it being an opportunity, structuring opportunity, and assigning value based on race, some having advantage, unfair disadvantage, and unfair advantage, but saps the strength of society through a waste of human resources. The majority of the empirical research on racial discrimination and health focuses on what's called interpersonal, so personally mediated individual level. This empirical evidence demonstrates that personally mediated racism acts through stress pathways to dysregulate body systems, resulting in accelerating aging and adverse health outcomes, and that these daily stressors are cumulative, where there's actual wear and tear on the body, also known as weathering. And as a result, the body cannot reach equilibrium. 
Re it reduces immune function, creates vulnerability and susceptibility to disease, limits the ability for the body to remain in a healthy state. Additionally, within the context of the biological processes and the specific health consequences, there are vestiges of structural and institutional forms of racism that we heard um, as well. That we cannot avoid the conversation about how institutions and structures are built to exclude, marginalize, and reprodu reproduce adverse health. That the policies, practices, structures, and inequities and power and privilege are fundamental in understanding and eliminating health equities. Dr. Julia Creer Perry, founder of the National Birth Equity Collaborative says, quote, racial disparities in health exist not because black people are broken or genetically inferior or make poor choices, but because policy continu continually tries to break us. Dr. Williams, leading US scholar on racism and health says that although institutional racism is arguably the most important mechanism in which racism affects health, it's challenging to capture in epidemiologic research. So as an epidemiologist, we're always thinking about measurement and how can we actually measure this and understand it. But I would add that we can't completely capture and quantify in any one study or even a series of studies. However, it's worthwhile to do this because as Dr. Rachel Hardiman articulates, it results in a focus on a level and a type that results in lasting change. There's er empirical evidence specifically about institutional racism, however, and its effects on health. And most of this work has focused on residential segregation as a fundamental cause of health inequity. That segregation is a result of specific policies, as we heard um, earlier. It's resulted in disparate social and physical environments, healthcare resources, housing, wealth attainment, to name a few, but also influences behavior and ultimately health outcomes. And my own work and others in the field argue that residential segregation is the result of housing policies such as redlining backed by the federal government as we heard earlier. And we see from some of the effects today. In my own empirical research, I highlight the intersections between lending disparities and, and health disparities um, and how we demonstrate that um, those who are living in areas that are considered redlined were more likely to um, experience stress and adverse birth outcomes. There are a few other studies that also demonstrate that novel measures of structural racism, such as racial inequity and political participation, judicial treatment and employment and job status are associated with infant mortality, infants being small or small for gestational age, as well as my myocardial infarction. Finally, in our conversation about racism, we would be remiss if we did not talk about the intersections with sexism, classism, homophobia, and other forms of oppression. I specifically mentioned gender racism earlier, but want to uplift intersectionality again, coined by Afro-Brazilian scholar Leila Gonzalez and black US scholar, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. This work specifically talks about the unique experiences of black women as a result of racism and sexism as interlocking systems of oppression. That discussions and strategies are incomplete when talking about racism and sexism alone. And research has shown time and time again that the stress of being a black woman or birthing person in America takes a significant toll on the body, resulting in adverse pregnancy and, and birth outcomes. This legislation as it stands is a critical first step to naming racism and specifically the effects of racism in health and well-being. However, there are critical elements that should be addressed in order to move forward, to be comprehensive, to have a lasting effect, and before this legislation is finalized and voted on. Number one. It is critical to understand and apply intersectionality as a gu guiding framework. That we cannot discuss racism without discussing how racism intersects with sexism, classism, homophobia, just for examples. Number two, if we are to identify racism as a public health crisis, it is critical to take an interdisciplinary approach that specifically engages experts in the field of public health. Elected officials can be a vehicle to pass important legislation, but in collaboration with experts in those respective fields. And experts do not necessarily mean only university folks. That public health practitioners, activists, and scholars co-lead these efforts with others from sectors such as housing, education, and employment, for example. Public health is a field in science trains professionals to think about and develop solutions from a quote, health in all lens, meaning asking the question of, how might health and well-being of populations be influenced by a particular action? Whether this is an action related to transportation, the built environment, climate change, or housing security. Three, health inequities are not disparities in that we are specifically talking about what is systematic, socially produced, unjust, and can be avoided. Given this definition, 
The proposed legislation should specifically develop actions that interrogate and dismantle the systems that create inequities. A root cause analysis that specifically asks how is racism, sexism, classism, homophobia altogether operating in this situation is critical. Four, the policies introduced should be in alignment with the Black Mamas Matter policy agenda, which include applying an intersectional lens, centering those most impacted, and particularly holding existing systems accountable, including healthcare and social service systems. Five, that in addition to understanding and acknowledging anti-black racism and how racism impacts black communities in the intersections, immigration policy has been identified as a mechanism of structural racism and anti-immigrant policies that also affect our Latinx and African-born communities, for example, have shown to lead to hostility, vulnerability, and adverse health outcomes. Six, with regard to the all-in implementation fund, that accountability measures be in place that there be an annual report to the public on the projects and activities being funded and how they help to address racism, and specifically a me mechanism to ensure that a council of citizens from communities most impacted by racism and oppression determine how funds will be spent. Council must consider appropriate measures to ensure accountability to the public on spending and measure effectiveness on the projects that are selected and that the fund itself, in addition to development entrepreneurial strategies, invest in additional sectors to address inequity, including health. Regarding the leadership forum, council should ensure that the forum is inclusive of public health experts, as I mentioned before, as the current policy link recommendations be expanded to include strategies to improve health outcomes. Eight, council should ensure that the leadership forum public meetings, although quarterly, are hosted at a time and place to ensure the public to be engaged. Furthermore, a council of citizens from this, as I mentioned, from specific communities most impacted should be integrally involved in co-leading all processes from beginning to end, including citizens who may not be professionals in government, non-government um, entities or nonprofit en entities, education or public health. So in closing, naming and identifying racism is a critical first step, but multiple aspects are necessary to ensure systematic and long-term change. Thank you. Statements to either email them to us so we can have them electronically yeah. mm -hmm. or leave them behind so we can, we can produce them. Dr. Uh, Dr. Macero, am I it right? Macero. Macero. All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Noble Macero, professor of public <clears throat> health practice, associate dean for diversity and inclusion, director of Center for Health Equity at Pitt School of Public Health. And like my colleague, Dr. Mendez, I come here uh, not speaking on the behalf of the university, but more or less to offer some comments uh, specific to my uh, expert opinion. Uh, just to give you some background, I've been in Pittsburgh now for about two and a half years, but uh, my primary uh, core of uh, professional work in public health was in uh, the state of Georgia, where we were the State Director for Primary Health Care, uh, State Director for Planning and Evaluation, and also the Founding Director of Morehouse School of Medicine's Master of Public Health Program, which became the first accredited program uh, for the HBCUs. Um, so let me also say that I want to extend uh, the appreciation and applaud uh, Councilman Lavelle as well as Council Member uh, Burgess for advancing this uh, uh, re resolution. Uh, so we're here more or less to offer some thoughts uh, more or less ar around our uh, experience in the practice of, of public health. Uh, certainly, uh, Dr. Mendez, what she has stated is, is right on point. And so I'm gonna try to fill in a few thoughts in terms of the application of what uh, she stated. Uh, let's see. Uh, so what happens uh, to a dream deferred? We know about Langston Hughes, and I think we can hear some of the expression in terms of what happens to that dream when it's deferred. It dries up like a raisin in the sun, or fester like a sore, and then run. Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over, 
like a syrupy, syrupy sweet. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? And so, again, I applaud uh, this honorable body uh, for following suit uh, in Milwaukee uh, in, in determining and identifying that uh, racism is, in fact, a public health crisis. So, in, the, in our practice, in terms of trying to achieve health equity, this body has, is already addressing uh, two of the principles in that regard, confronting racism. And let me just add, uh, building on uh, my colleague, Dr. Mendez, we're talking about confronting institutional racism. Uh, and then secondly, that government plays a key role in achieving racial and health equity. We're also, during our remarks, we're gonna uh, more or less um, address the importance of building strategic partnerships across sectors and communities. Okay. All right, so what racism? What racism being black in America can be hazardous to your health but it's more than just being black. It's what are the conditions that essentially are the triggers that, are, uh, that affects the body, and as we'll see, that affects the neighborhood, that affects the community, that affects a nation, that affects our people. So the racism is a system of, opp of oppression that relies on the belief that one place or one race or one or, or a group of people is superior to another based on characteristics uh, like skin color. But it's driven by what? White supremacy. And in our experience, um, uh, Dr. Howe talked about um, 500 years of oppression, meaning the 1500s, 1480s, most of us more or less um, focus on or at least start our clock in terms of African Americans in the United States with 1619. So roughly 400 years, uh, African Americans have been subjected to oppression. And so <clears throat> the bottom line for this particular image of this slide for yours truly, is that as we are dealing with public health or ra as a, a racism as a public health crisis, that as we attend to these issues, as we develop interventions, let's be clear, racism is not going to be, in, is, will not end in this nation in our lifetime. It's not going to happen. However, there are solutions. There are things that we can do that will more or less ameliorate our condition of what's taking place in terms of, of oppression. So our aim that we're advancing is equity, not equality, but understanding what are the um, challenges that e exist in our respective neighborhoods. So in terms of this body, in terms of the resolution, as Dr. Mendez has, has, has eloquently stated, is that equity, we should have, this res resolution should be an equity-focused policy that's going to address interventions uh, on, in, in terms of what are those strategic, strategic uh, situations that occur in our communities and our neighborhoods that are, that are the drivers for inequity. So we're looking at a systems response. A systems response is needed to ensure that Pittsburgh, and I'm quoting from the document, becomes a world-class city that works for everyone. And when we're talking about uh, not treating the illnesses, but the conditions that make, make, that make folks ill or sick. And it's, uh, you noted in the previous um, slide, it was primarily uh, white folks that were subjected to conditions that are making them ill. So it's the conditions that's making us ill is not race selective. So in this particular case, as you see, in terms of the Schwartz, Schwartz market, in terms of our, the African-American community. So we're also looking at 
erasing the gaps, that we don't look at this situation in terms of a black-white disparity. When we do, we don't wish to look at a numeric differential, just the number uh, that's different. We want to look at what are the, the resources, what is the distribution of resources that affect and influence uh, a neighborhood or a community's conditions, all right? So that comes back to the systemic. And so uh, it also implies that there is something called just and unjust. What is unjust appropriation of expenditures in our respective communities? We had a report here that the city uh, issued perhaps a year ago called the Pittsburgh Equity Indicators. That's an excellent start. But what's lacking and what we must do, again, is to address the systemic drivers that are responsible for the uh, inequities uh, specific to uh, uh, social determinants of health. And let's be clear, when we say that racism is a public health crisis, racism is one of nine or 12 determinants, social determinants of health. Racism is one of those. Those other elements that we're talking about are what? Housing, education, transportation, et cetera. So let's be, let's be clear when we focus on racism as a public health crisis, there are other elements that are the drivers of racism and other elements that are responsible for the inequities that are in our respective communities. Some of those are right there. And so at the tip of the iceberg, we see what the outcomes in terms of those, those racial disparities. So when someone says that, okay, diabetes is an issue, obes obesity is an issue, there's a difference in cardiovascular or acute myocardial, myocardial infarctions, that's a numeric difference. What are the drivers for obesity? That's what we're talking about, all right? So let's be clear about that. And so we also, we also want, to, want to focus or, or, or know that those drivers for inequities are unjust. And so, respectively, in terms of the 63 neighborhoods that's placed on this graph in terms of life expectancy in the city of Pittsburgh, it ranges from a low of 62, Larimer, Larimer has 62, life expectancy, to a high in terms of the high point, or is that Highland? Highland Park. Highland Park, Highland Park is 84 years. So there is a 22 differ, uh, year differential. Keep in mind that only nine neighborhoods reach the life expectancy for the United States. Life expectancy in the United States is 78.6 years of age. So only nine of the communities, neighborhoods in the city of Pittsburgh, exceed, reach or exceed USA's life expectancy. Which are Pardon me? Which are uh, You're asking someone who's visually challenged at this distance on that screen? But, uh, <laughs> Larimer is on the end. We'll get, we'll get copies of the presentation. Yeah, Lar Lar Larimer is on the end. Thank you. You're quite welcome. But here's the deal. When you look at Larimer, it's my understanding. Pardon me? It's right next to Highland Park. Yeah, it's right next to Highland Park. Right. So that, that speaks to the, to the maldistribution of resources that are going to, or not going to Larimer, that's going other places. But it's not just Larimer. Remember, there's only nine neighborhoods or communities that are reaching the 78.6 metric in terms of life expectancy in USA. And I dare say, that those other 56 or odd neighborhoods are not majority white or majority black. So there are issues there that we have to take into account. And so let me put this in a little bit more clear context. In 1900, life expectancy in the United States was 47 years of age, in 1900. Fast forward to the turn of the century, 21st century, 1999 to 2000, life expectancy was 77 years of age. So there was a 30 year improvement in longevity. But 25 of those 30 year improvement, 25 of those 30 years was attributed to what? Sewers. 
SDOH, <laughs> the Social Determinants of Health, Sorry. addressing issues like education, housing, <laughs> employment. All right? Councilman Gross, I didn't catch it. What did you I say? said sewers. I say sewers for everything. Sewers, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, sanitation is definitely infrastructure. Sanitation is definitely in the mix. So I'm, I'm going to more or less place this slide again where we see McKeesport, which has a 62.3% white population. McKeesport's <coughs> life expectancy is around 60, I mean 71. So it's below the, uh, the uh, life expectancy for US. So the framework that we're at advancing for this body is that in this resolution, that we want to focus on the left side, the left side of that particular image, which, is the so, which are the social determinants of health. Remember, 25 of 30 years improvement was due to SDOH. The other five years is primarily associated with health care, the medical model, going to a hospital, et cetera, for that intervention. All right, oops, I, I guess uh, the gremlins want me to hurry up and get out of here. So we're talking about what, what's needed to burst these walls in terms of the obstacles around the social determinants of health. What's needed? Again, as, as uh, Dr. Mendez stated, is addressing these issues around attacking racism, but also, in addition, looking at what are those inequities in terms of employment, et cetera. And this is where I want to make a point in terms of employment. <coughs> the largest employer here in uh, Western PA is what? UPMC. So when we talk to, when we do our, our numbers in terms of UPMC, we, look, we looked at the Homewood. And Homewood, in terms of the median income for Homewood, uh, is $44,000, almost $45,000. And in the Hill District, it's $31,000 in terms of the median income. And so we looked at what are the, the number of employees who actually work for UPMC that live respectively in Homewood and in the Hill District. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? 61%, uh, we're talking about the Hill District, 61% out of the, uh, this, the, end, the end number there is around 1,300. 778 individuals, they earn less than $40,000. 61% earn less than $40,000, all right? Re remember, only 61%. Only However, additionally, when we looked at the Homewood uh, community, we found that only 43% 1,379 individuals earn more than $40,000. So 43% earn $40,000 or less. Totally, the 39% earn within the $40,000 to $60,000 uh, category. So the punchline there is that there's an underemployment in terms of the median wage opportunities for those individuals who work for UPMC and live in Homewood and the Hill District. Lastly, let me just also say that when we drive through our respective neighborhoods and our communities, there is something called the Lead Service Line uh, Replacement Project. And we, when we drive through those neighborhoods, our communities, what do we see? Or what do we not see on those work crews? So here are the facts. The facts are, for those individuals, for during the summer period, in terms of the contractors, there were only two individuals who had a zip code that lived in the city of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. Now you do the math on that in terms of <coughs> the wealth, or at least the opportunities that's not taking place in that particular neighborhood and community. So if you can envision, um, working or having a crew that's majority African-American, 98% African-American working in a white neighborhood or community, what do you think that the uh, outcry would be? So 
to Dr. Mendez's point, and what we're advancing to this body, is that when we look at policies, in terms of looking at health equity from a, a all, how should I say this, all health and all policies perspective, we're looking at what's taking place in our neighborhoods in terms of housing, employment, and economic development. And there has to be an equitable uh, share of that economic development. All right? Yes. And, 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 and so here we're talking about the polling place. It says, did you have to wait too long? And the gentleman says, only a few hundred years. Now, as I, as I mentioned, we had the honor of being able to serve as the health commissioner in uh, Cincinnati, but we also had the honor and the privilege of being the health officer in our native city, the city of Detroit. So I'm not here more or less to say what's, what's needed, but also to leave here with some definite positive examples that what can actually take place. And when we arrived in Cincinnati, the, life, the uh, infant mortality rate for the, city, for the city was roughly uh, 13 point something. And when we left after our 10 year service there, and just as a as an aside, let it be known that the average tenure for a health commissioner is three years. Mm. We were there for 10 years. And as a result of our service there in collaboration with partners, the infant mortality rate went down to 7.9. That's 7.9 infant deaths per 1,000 live births. The national goal is six infant deaths per 1,000 live births. Now we also, and this is also a valuable and important point here, is that as a health commissioner in Cincinnati, we had 22 primary health care sites. So we wanted to know what actually took place when Mrs. Jones went through our turnstiles. Well, guess what? The infant mortality rate in, when we left went down to 4.5. As you know, that the population and the clients that attend are that go to health departments are marginally, are income marginal. And it's not just black and white in terms of the city of Cincinnati. So the infant mortality rate of 4.5. I bring that up to show that there's a demonstrated improvement that can take place, but also a concern that I have. And I've expressed this before, but I'm gonna make it plain today. You have the Allegheny County Health Department. Those numbers in terms of life expectancy was driven by the <coughs> graduate school in public health at the University of Pittsburgh. The point is that this is, these are numbers and demo, uh, issues that can be generated out of the Allegheny County Health Department, but what's absent there, and it, there's quite a few things that's absent, but for this body, I would recommend, highly recommend, that the city council, the city of, of uh, Pittsburgh, have a representative, a formal representative on the Board of Health for the Allegheny County Health Department. D these decisions that are being made policy-wise, if, if, if we don't have a voice on the Board of Health at the Allegheny Health Department, what you're proposing, what we're proposing, is all for naught in terms of what needs to be done in terms of public health. You're talking about a public health crisis. With, so with that stated, I'm gonna leave you with health equity is our goal. That's our objective. There are quite a few other things that we need to attend to, but health equity is the target, is our goal. And lastly, my colleague, Dara Mendez, I always have to be proud of those of us who served and graduated at an HBCU school. She mentioned Spelman. We got to mention Morehouse as well. And Dr. King, and Dr. King, in terms of what his stance was, in terms of what? Social justice. And so I'll leave, I'll leave that and turn it over to my learned colleague. My friend and mentor, Dr. Taylor. Exactly. There always is, <clears throat> and especially for me at this moment, uh, a disadvantage of being the last to speak. 
there has been so much said already that is consistent with what I believe deeply. Um, I'd like to go to three things, perhaps. The first is, what's the cause? And we've been, I think, uh, speaking about that. I want to add a little twist to that. What are the remedies? And what are the expected outcomes? Um, let me go to the issue of causation because I've spent pretty much a professional lifetime studying the effects of racism on black people from almost the crib to senescence. And here's what we find. <clears throat> We find that the 400 years of cultural misconstruction and maltreatment of black people is consequential. Nearly 50% of black people have absorbed racist stereotypes about blacks. And what does that mean? Blacks are mentally defective, mentally, morally, and intellectually. That's the core understanding of the inner response to black life, to white racism in the environment. Also, the stereotypes that blacks are physically gifted, athletically, sexually, and also rhythmically. So what are the consequences of that black identification with racist stereotypes that has been running now, culturally, programmatically, for more than 400 years. Let me profile it for you. And we have studied blacks in four countries of Africa, seven countries of the Caribbean, and seven states in America. Here's a synopsis of what we have found. Blacks who have identified with racist stereotypes about blacks, they tend to report higher levels of depression, of anxiety, of stress, and also hostility. That goes to the mental domain but we also find that they report higher levels of type 2 diabetes. They report higher levels of cardiovascular disease. What I'm trying to say to you is that racism is culturally and personally consequential. Let me say to you also that we did a study of black inmates, inmates in uh, Maryland, state of Maryland, and we found that the blacks there that had committed more serious crimes, more heinous crimes against other blacks, guess what? They believed that blacks were just the things that I've already said to you. You got it right. <laughs> Now, now, it's consequential also in terms of quality of family life, you all. Blacks who bring that to the table of their relationship to their intimate partners, much more disruption, much more conflict, much more dissolution of those relationships. Racism then is personal, it's cultural, 
It's consequential. It's the seedbed for racial disparities of a very wide and embarrassing range. Now, the question then becomes, are there remedies? And I want to lift two types of remedies because I think in the past we have gotten only one right. One type of remedy would be what we, we've been talking about, economic capital development. Affordable housing, that's good. Mm -hmm. Improved existing housing stock, that's good. And especially good is increased home ownership by blacks. That's better still. I want you to know that I support policies affecting those outcomes. But I also want you to know that we won't get home free by just supporting these economic capital policies and practices. So then I'm adding a complementary type of capital development. Let's call it human capital development, which must be joined with economic capital development if we are ever going to see the light of justice and freedom in this country. What do I mean by human capital? Number one, we gotta close racial achievement gaps in math, in reading, in science. We can't be moseying along here, it's too late, y'all. 400 years, it's too late. The question then becomes, how do you do it? Fortunately, we have the evidence we've done it. And even here in Pittsburgh, right? We've done it in the Hill, we have done it in Homewood, we have done it in Larimer. creating schools that have accelerated rates of improvement for black students that are higher than the rates of celebration of, 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 um, of achievement for white students. And that's the only way you're gonna close the gap. You know what I'm saying? You gotta figure out a way of more greatly accelerating the rate of closure for black students. You can't mosey along after 400 years. You gotta giddy up. Hmm? We gotta create safe neighborhoods, number two. Number three, we have to create healthy neighborhoods. Number four, we have to enhance family health. Number five, we need to enhance mental health. And number six, we need to enhance physical health. Yes, all that. All that. We've got to eliminate the gaps. Mm -hmm. Now the question becomes, can we do it? I'm doing it. My question has already been answered. <laughs> Shh, can that order, please? <laughs> My question has already been answered. So I won't try to belabor, belabor any further elaboration on that point. But I want to end on what the expected outcomes would be. The expected outcomes would be justice and freedom. 
at last. Materialization of our nation's vision articulated 243 years ago, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I'm finished. So I want all of, all of you, if you would electronically get me Please. or physically get me your remarks and presentations or both would be great. Um, I'm going to go to the third panel, but, first, but second of all, I don't want to miss this moment. This is a historic moment that we're having in the city of Pittsburgh. This, we've never had a panel like you to address this city in this forum. And you're, we are creating something that is absolutely a historic moment in the history of the city. And we want to thank you for coming to be a part of this. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. So, I know we have to get to a third panel. I just want to ask two quick questions to sort of try to summarize what I heard. Is it fair to say that um, racism as a social condition is fundamental to the health disparities faced by blacks in our city? Absolutely. That's it. My question was to try to capture everything that was mentioned in you all's presentation. Is it fair to say that racism as a social condition is fundamental to the health disparities faced by blacks in our city? Absolutely. Okay. I would also so, say inequities, not just the disparities, because that's a numeric difference. When we okay. say it's fundamental to addressing the health inequities, when we deal with the health inequities piece, then we're talking about just, what's being just, as doc, and Dr. Mm -hmm. Unfair. Okay. All right? That's key. That's important. And not on accident and unavoidable. Okay. Um, last, and Dr. Howe, you may want to answer, but anyone can. Is it also fair to say that race and racism are not interchangeable constructs? Um, um, sorry, I, I'm smiling because I, I was actually referencing to you earlier that we were. I was talking to my PhD students this week, so it just makes me smile because that is a live debate in, in the field. I would actually say that, yes, they are completely in, inseparable. Um, that race, the concept of race is racism, and racism is race. Okay. Do you want me to break that down in a different way? Not, not necessarily. Here, here's what I was trying to ask. Is it, from a, from a health perspective, is being born black, does that sort of determine your health? It, or is being born black in a racially stratified city more determinant of your health, which is the racism, not necessarily the race? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, in our field, in particular in um, maternal child health, perinatal health, we say it's not race, it's racism that causes the inequities that we see in pregnancy and birth outcomes, that it's the social construction, that it's the milieu, it's the environment okay. of racism, which is a system that has produced this. Um, inequity. I would completely agree with that. My only point, and maybe it's too academic, but my only point is that being born black, it, that statement is a social construction, and sure, that, that construction is a racist construction. And so that we can't even separate what it means to be born black from the system that is the social construction of racism. Okay. Because that category doesn't exist without that history. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Hey, cast this down. Yep. Okay. So finally, we're going to have our last panel of the day. We have Richard Stewart, uh, Jr. of the NAACP, Tim Stevens from BPEP, Jada Sherrell from Healthy Start, and Dr. Uh, Shannon Gilliam from the Homewood Children's Village. I do, in this, I do want to acknowledge the members of the All In uh, coalition who are in attendance and hopefully will play a 
strategic part in hosting the Leadership Policy Conference. All right, if you would come and this will be our last panel of the evening. I'm speechless. Yeah. All right, and so we're asking that each of you would give um, a few moments, give me a few minutes to give your perspective and reaction, and then we will have council members. And then remember, everyone, 630, Ebenezer Baptist Church, everyone here who has not spoken, members of the public, you will be given a chance to speak to council. All right. Good evening. My name is Richard A. Stewart, Jr. I'm the president of NAACP Pittsburgh, and uh, I want to thank you the two the councilmen, uh, Mr. Burgess and Mr. Bell, for having NACP here. And myself and one of my colleagues, board member, Alicia, sitting over there, we thank you for being here. I uh, want to read my statement, and um, it goes like this. Resolution recognizing racism as a public health crisis. Topic, opioid academic. Racism is relevant as well as a health crisis when it comes to issues of opioid epidemic and distribution of Narcan in the low-income minority poverty-stricken communities. Why is it that Narcan is not made readily available? I want this put into legislation if we can, a part of this going forward. Why is it readily made available in these communities as it is made in the more predominantly Caucasian communities? Are residents made aware of where and how to get this Narcan? Where is the location at these communities such as the, back up, where is, where is it located at in these communities such as Hill District, Homewood, Wilkinsburg, Bell Suver, and Sheridan, and many other communities? We need to get educated about that. The topic of education and racism raises the health crisis in a very serious issue that has a tremendous impact in African-American families. Students who may suffer from this traumatic trauma at home. And I wanna also say, a lot of these students come to school, they might have, might have seen something at the house, or they might have not haven't eaten, or they might have had bad dreams, but, but yet still, the school system put them in a precarious position and, and sometimes they lock them up. That's wrong. They need to talk to them and find out what's going on. Students who may suffer from the trauma at home and or the community as a false being diagnosed with a learning disorder and being labeled and identified, which will have a greater effect on their adult life that may lead to a higher dropout rate unemployment and incarcerations increase. My final paragraph here, CAM is issued of trauma and its impact it has on students, learning to view more intensely so that proper support resources, diagnosis can be administered. That is very important. We need to add that to that and, and let people know maybe we can stem the tide of them knowing where to go to get help instead of waiting on law enforcement to get there. That's my statement because we've covered other issues, other areas. This is important also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Okay. Good afternoon. First of all, I wanna thank you all for having this. As you said, it's a very unique, I've been in council many, many years, many times. And this is one of the most unique conversations, if not the most unique, in terms of its potential impact. So I wanna congratulate uh, Councilman Lavelle and Burgess and the other council members for supporting this effort. And I wanna read into the record some things from a previous statement, and it ties into some of what we've heard today. June 10th, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette reported an article written by Harold Miller that the Pittsburgh region ranked dead last in indicators of racial and economic parity in comparison to 
39 other cities or regions, I should say, in the country with regard to conditions of the black working poor and black children. This report led BPAP, the Black Political Empowerment Project, in 2011 to lay the foundation for the creation of corporate equity and inclusion roundtable. An analysis prepared in 2012 by the Three Rivers Workforce Investment Board reported that African Americans in the Pittsburgh region make less than other groups in the same sector of work. Many of us who live in the Pittsburgh region celebrate and even brag about the many number one ratings and top 10 ratings that either the city of Pittsburgh or the region have had over the years. And the sad news is that African Americans as a group, based on that 2010 article by Harold Miller, the 2010 analysis by the Three Rivers Workforce Investment Board and the recent University of Pittsburgh report on the conditions of blacks in Pittsburgh, do not allow African Americans to tout such success in terms of their conditions or our conditions as black people or anything close to a top 10 rating when compared to other cities in the United States of America. And I want to put in context that report from Harold Miller was 2010, the report that the university and, and the equity commission came about in the city of Pittsburgh was 10 years, basically 10 years later. So it shows we have had none Little or no progress. The headline written by J. Dale Shoemaker, a public source in the article of September 17th, states a very sad and troubling reality. Quote, Pittsburgh black residents feel consequences of inequality more starkly than in other cities, New City Report finds. And what many African Americans, hopefully many other Pittsburghers, found beyond disturbing are the words attributed to the woman who sat at this table today. Dr. Junior Howell, Assistant Professor of Sociology, University of Pittsburgh, and her analysis of the Pittsburgh situation, quote, I found this extremely disturbing, I don't know anybody else. What this means is that if black residents got up today and left and moved to the majority of any other cities in the United States, automatically by just moving, by just getting up, and moving, their income would go up, their educational opportunities for their children would go up, as well as their employment." End of quote. And our statement in the October 21st news conference from Beef Happening Coalition Against Violence and Corporate Equity was, what an indictment on the city of Pittsburgh and the leadership of our companies, our corporations, our universities, our colleges, our nonprofits. All of us are at fault. None of us have done enough, including the community activists. Such a stark reality is certainly not an advertisement for blacks who are looking throughout the nation for employment to seriously consider the employment of themselves and others in Pittsburgh, nor for whites or other races and ethnicities who wish to work in environments where the employment, retaining, training, and promotion of African Americans are seen and embraced as top priorities. The headline of the October 9th through 15th edition of the New Pittsburgh Courier. Black women live in poverty in Pittsburgh than comparable cities adds to the poor image of Pittsburgh and cries out for change, cries out for aggressive action by all of us. That there are serious problems with regard to equity, diversity, and inclusion in the overall conditions of black people and black women in particular in Pittsburgh, it remains unacceptable hopefully to everybody in this room and certainly to counsel the fact that you're having this session today. The fact that black and other non-white women earn between 54 cents and 59 cents for every dollar a white man makes in the city of Pittsburgh. This is 2019, almost 2020. That almost seems impossible for those kind of statistics still to exist. The New Pittsburgh Courier mentioned that black women live in poverty in Pittsburgh more than 85% compared to 85% of other cities. Our poverty level is higher than 85% of any other city 
85 other cities in this nation. 85%. The article goes on to mention that while whites tend to find employment across high to low income employment sectors, blacks are more segregated with fewer in the high income positions, such as attorney, engineer, and mathematician. So even at the higher levels of people who do get educated, the racism still continues. Not just for poor blacks, but across the board. Another moment, or troubling statistic identified in this report, this report was that the maternal mortality rate among black mothers in Pittsburgh was worse than a vast majority of comparable cities, and that the rate of infant mortality for black babies is more than six times higher than it is for white babies. And we live in a city that we brag about, in a region that we brag about, that has all these wonderful health facilities. How could that be? Black communities are within minutes from great hospitals. I thought about this for years, like, how can that be? If we don't fix this stuff this time, like I said, this other report goes back nine years. So we obviously haven't done much. And for this embarrassment, that's what it is for this city and this region. It's an embarrassment. We can either take the embarrassment as an incentive to do, or we can just say, well, it's so deep we won't do a thing. And I'm sure that's not what we're here for today. And this one I found disturbing. We applaud Mayor Perduto in boldly stating in his September 17th press conference that, quote, we have rates within the black community that are third world when it comes to infant mortality. And there shouldn't be anyone in the city of Pittsburgh that can accept that fact and not be asking, what am I doing? What is my company doing? What is my organization doing? We hope those other parts will be forthcoming. I would hope. Now, over the years, I would hope they're forthcoming because they need to be. Over the years, many African Americans, when we frequently hear the words, I want you to hear this, Describing Pittsburgh as a most livable city, quote unquote, most black people, a good number of black people, can't help but ask the question, for whom is it most livable? As I was leaving our BPEP headquarters on the Sunday I was working on this uh, press conference statement of October 21st, I couldn't help but notice the relatively new garbage can located in front of our office at Wiley and Kirkpatrick. On the can were these words, Pittsburgh, a most livable city. And what all of us want to know, and what all of us want within the black community of Pittsburgh, and our organizations, and our community partners, is that the words on a garbage can can actually mean something to all of Pittsburgh, including black Pittsburgh. That's what we must do. And we talked about earlier, some of the folks here talked about solutions. Out of that report in 2010 led to the creation of the Corporate Equity Inclusion Roundtable. Here is a 15-page document with specific strategies for implementation. What we ask is, and this has been refined over a period of seven years now, if you read this, and if everybody in this room reads it, if every corporation and university and college adopts this and implements it, not for a year or two or five, you ever go to the doctor and they say, take some pills. They say, take it for 10 days, and you take it for three days, and you start to feel better, and then you quit taking the medication. Guess what? You're still sick, or it'll come back on you. This is a plan, a game plan for action. It is very specific. Even the executive vice president of, of PNC has called this one of the most comprehensive approaches to, to, to actually doing something about inequity in our Pittsburgh community. We talk about violence. One of our initiatives of BPAP is a coalition against violence. Black folks will wake up dysfunctional for no reason. We have problems. Seeds have been planted in our minds in our community, which caused us some of us to react in a way that's not productive, but it's understandable. We have a game plan for action. 
And we're asking that this action plan not be put in for a day or two or three or four years. It becomes part of the system. The city of Pittsburgh can adopt this. The county can adopt it. Corporations can adopt it. Covestro we met with the other day said they are, they're, they're taking this on. And one piece of it is, by the way, ban the box. We have too many black people and Hispanic people, people of color coming out of prisons. If we don't, in the city, I, I congratulate, the city has adopted, I believe, in 2010 or something like that, and the county in 2012. We want every entity in the region to accept ban the box. When someone comes out of prison, they have an opportunity for a new life, not just to go back to a life of, 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 of imprisonment. So you as political leaders can encourage the corporate community and the university community and the nonprofit community to accept that concept as well as the game plan in this document. And I want to commend all those who spoke today. It was a very powerful day. And I did have, before I finish, just a comment on the recommendations of Dr. Uh, was that Adrian? Yeah, Mendez and Dr. I'm sorry, I had it in my, my writing is so bad. Mendez. Yes, Dr. Mendez. I think her recommendations were very powerful in terms of the inclusiveness that she described in how council hopefully would go about implementation of what you have proposed in terms of your legislation, that it be multifaceted in terms of who participates, not just all the folks at the top, but the folks at the bottom, the folks in the middle, so it would be a collective, inclusive process. Does that make sense to people? An inclusive process. And Dr. Masera, in the social determinants of health, that's a big deal because all this stuff comes together as to why we are in the conditions that we're in today. And of course, my friend, Dr. Taylor, he always has brilliance. We're in a situation we are now because we've never gone, we've never recovered from slavery. We've never, come, we've never recovered from that. Even how we are as black people, between those who are light and those who are dark and those who are in between and those who are poor and those who are rich or wealthy or in between. And we beat each other up because we've been, had hatred put into our own psyche for our own people. And this is, a, this is not a black problem, it's an American problem. And it's a Pittsburgh regional problem. And we're hopeful that all of us will come together and do what needs to be done because we don't need to come back to another table in another 10 years and the statistics are just as bad as they were the 10 years before. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity, Council, to participate on this esteemed panel and to provide testimony on racism as a public health crisis. My name is Jada Sherrell, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Healthy Start. Um, I'm a black woman, a mother, a wife, a sister, and a daughter, among other things. I'm a Pittsburgh native, growing up in the East End, in the East Suburbs, and I've witnessed firsthand how racism erodes the well-being of everyone at all levels. Today, in my desire to serve my community, I'm providing testimony specifically on the impacts of racism to maternal and child health, and bringing awareness to disparities in maternal and child health outcomes in both the United States and in our city. For many, choosing to accept that racism is alive and thriving and that it contributes to the makeup of systems in our society that intentionally and consistently oppress people to the point of loss of humanity, both metaphorically and physically, may require a shift in thinking and abandonment of core beliefs but it's well documented. The American Public Health Association asserts that racism structures opportunity and assigns value based on how a person looks. Mm. The result, conditions that unfairly advantage some and unfairly disadvantage others. Racism hurts the health of our nation by preventing some people the opportunity to attain their highest level of health. Dr. Kamara Jones is previously mentioned by Dr. Mendez who is an American physician, epidemiologist, and medical anthropologist, as well as a civil rights activist, who specializes on the effects of racism and social inequalities on personal health, further studies the impact of racism on communities. 
We can see how this structured system of advantage and disadvantage plays out in neighborhood conditions, investments in education, in law enforcement, in health, and even in politics. But what does this look like for the health of black women and babies in our region? There were just under 4 million births in the United States in 2016. The infant mortality rate which is the number of deaths per 1,000 live births, was 5.87. Again, this is 2016 for the entire country. For whites, this rate was 4.9. For blacks, this rate was 11.9. In Allegheny County, with a little over 13,000 births in 2016, the infant mortality rate collectively was 6.1. For whites, this rate was 3.3 lower than the national average. For blacks, this rate was 14.9, above the national average. This is our county. In 2015, for the city of Pittsburgh, the infant mortality rate for black babies was 13.8, again, above the national average. A strong and consistent body of research tells us that this is not a consistent, a coincidence of poor personal choices or genetic inferiority. Dr. Art James, OBGYN and pediatrician and associate professor of, of obstetrics, gynecology and pediatrics at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center says, disparities are mostly the result of policy decisions that systematically disadvantage some populations over others. Dr. Arlene Geronimus, researcher at the University of Michigan Population Studies Center, says that the weathering effect considers stressors that impact people of color and are chronic and repeated through their whole life course, and in fact may even be at their height in the young adult through middle ages rather than in early life. And that increases general health vulnerability. Emerald Snipes, who's the daughter of Eric Garner and the sister of Erica Garner, who died shortly after childbirth, stated, they pull out one piece at a time, at a time, and another piece and another piece, until you sort of collapse and you start losing pieces of your health and well-being. The Black Mamas Matter Alliance states, Engagement of communities most impacted in crafting policies and programs that impact their ability to thrive is a core human rights principle. Dr. Dara Mendez, associate professor at the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health and Center for Health Equity, in response to a publica publication regarding the appropriate use of race in research, says investigators should engage affected communities in exploring the construction of race and how it shows up in their lives. There are methods to facilitate this that can deeply influence how research is carried out and its effects on black people's lives. Third, partnering with critical race scholars, public health practitioners, and transdisciplinary teams is critical. Dr. Troya Creer Perry, founder and president of the National Birth Equity Collaborative and member of the Black Mamas Matter Alliance states, cultural transformation depends on the capacity for providers and systems to listen, understand, and respond to community voices. And finally, a collection of black women and femmes in Pittsburgh who have been doing maternal and child health and public health work stated in response to the gender equity report, these reports and their conclusions will not only serve as a basis for suggested policy, but also allocation of resources. When as a collective of black women and femmes, we have been leading this work in many cases without financial resources, institutional support, and platforms to recognize our thought leadership. These recommendations should come from the black community and those who have been long engaged in this work, centering them as experts in their own well-being. Dr. Abby Fapuhanda, Alisi Davis, Demia Horsley, Danae Wilson, Dara Mendez, Felicia Savage-Friedman, Irene Gathru, Jada Sherrell, 
Jessica Ruffin, Latasha Mays, Lovey Jewel Jackson Foster, Maxine Wright Waters, Ngazi D. Tibbs, Rochelle Jackson, Sharon McDaniel, Shamira Williams, Sueño Viveros, Tiffany Gary Webb, and Wendy Guy. Locally and nationally, Healthy Start is working to strengthen the foundations at the community, state, and national levels to help women and infants and families reach their fullest potential. We believe that racism is a significant contributor to these disparities in outcomes. We believe that solutions lie in the communities and investments should reflect this. Throughout Pittsburgh and Allegheny County, Healthy Start serves over 1,000 women and babies annually in hopes of mitigating some of the crippling impacts of racism on their lives. By providing direct support, education, medical advocacy, and systems coordination, our mothers and babies are far more equipped to navigate the various systems that impact their health. We also consider our families' experiences, concerns, hopes and aspirations, and the context in which they live to be just as important as any data point. Where women are not healthy, children and families will not be healthy. Where children and families are not healthy, communities will not be healthy. And if black men cannot be healthy, families cannot thrive. The vigor by which the legacy of racism lives on in our country and in our city is shameful and more importantly, harmful. Legislation that recognizes the impact of racism on public health has the potential to drive systemic change in Pittsburgh. However, effective policy requires full and direct participation of members of the groups impacted. With that said, we advise against any public health related legislation that does not include public health leadership and a holistic focus on the social determinants of health. Against any public health related legislation that is hasty and not inclusive of the appropriate experts and stakeholders at all stages. Against any public health related legislation that does not provide foundation for how community will be meaningfully involved in shared decision making. Against any public health related legislation that does not explicitly include and hold accountable our health systems, as well as the myriad of other systems that have been previously mentioned. Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, a professor, professor at Columbia Law School, who also directs the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies and is co-founder of the African American Policy Forum and co-coined the term intersectionality which describes racism and sexism as interlocking systems of oppression resulting in a form of disadvantage that affects black women uniquely. Intersectionality is a critical equity focused approach that needs to be explicit in this legislation. Finally, to quote James Carlton, American author and disability rights activist, nothing about us without us. Thank you. Last. So last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Shannon Gilliam from the Homewood Children's Village. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for asking me to speak today. Um, as you said, my name is Dr. Shanna Tharp Gilliam. I am a developmental psychologist by training. I'm the director of research and evaluation at the Homewood Children's Village. As I've sat here and listened today, I have nothing more to add to the science. I think it's been thoroughly explained and there, is, um, there are myriad and robust reasons why this uh, is an issue that we need to move forward with in this way. Um, fellow Pitts Pittsburghers, we have a choice to make. Will, be, will we be a region with the unenviable future that black and brown residents continue to have more of what's worse and small gains in growth, health, and well-being? Or will we embrace the transformational destiny of life and hope that comes with working together for equity? That's a question we have to make. It's a question we have to answer. We have to address it not only at the highest levels of the city government, but also in the streets, in the alleys, in our communities. We must have full and direct inclusion of communities to be a part of the change that we want to see. 
do not do things to us, we want to do them together. I'm reminded of my mother and my grandfather who were active civil rights activists. My mother was an active member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and a foot soldier in the Selma, Alabama movement for civil rights. My grandfather was the president of the Selma, Dallas County NAACP, was one of the um, organizers for the Edmund Pettus Bridge crossing. There is a legacy that we have to recognize and appreciate that the fight is not over. We must continue to stand for citizens who do not have a voice in this room today. We must also stand for youth who were active, viable, valuable contributors to those 1960s movements. This is their future that we are fighting for today. They should be at the table. They should be there hearing the decisions, helping to make decisions that are not only going to impact us, but are also going to impact our future and their future and the future of our grandchildren and great grandchildren. This is not difficult. It's not difficult to bring people into a conversation and not have a conversation about them, but to have it with them. These concepts are complex, but they're not so complex that young people cannot get the information that they need to feel like they are actually being included in this process. And as a person who has de devoted my life to the service of a community that is looking and asking the question, how are our children? I encourage us to not leave out the youth. Thank you. Thank you. So That ends, that ends, our, that ends the um, presentation part. Um, now, as we go to our close, as customary, we'll have response for our members of council, starting with uh, Councilman Cockill. Well, that's a lot to digest. I'll tell you what this, you know, I want to thank all the esteemed people who were on the panels. Uh, I came here sure. to listen today more than anything. And uh, I learned a lot, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of figures that are really disturbing, actually, uh, to yeah. me. And I'll say this, um, you know, it breaks my heart that, um, you know, the city of Pittsburgh is below average when it comes to uh, racial discrimination. It, it really breaks my heart. And maybe it's because I'm a white kid that grew up in Beachview, um, very, very much poverty stricken. We didn't have a family car. We didn't have a house. We struggled. And I think my upbringing, and I'll credit my mother, there was no room for racism. We don't have a racist bo bone in our body, at least in my family. And I'm not so naive to think that's the case amongst the other neighbors, of course. But, but uh, you know, when I, by the time I got to high school, I'm a big believer in segregation. You know, we were thrown together with the Hill District and Hazelwood and Beachview and Brookline. And, uh, you know, it was, is that for you? I'm sorry. So, so, and it was a really great experience for me. You know, I played on the football team. I fought be, beside the kids from the Hill District and they had my back and we had their back. And, you know, I was proud to fight with them. And when we talk about, you know, when we talk about work, work development, I often wonder, and I talked to Councilman Lavelle about this on occasion, you know, people that I went to school with who were great leaders, whether it be on that field or, or in the school, and why they're not working in our local building trades or why, why I don't see them as police officers on the street. So I don't claim to know, you know, uh, the answers to all these difficult questions. But I do know this. I worked with Reverend Burgess in his neighborhood. I see the fight that he gives for equality in his neighborhood and, and the people who get behind him and, and the effort he puts in. Same with Councilman Lavelle. You know, um, I'm really excited about the Lower Hill development. And, and in, in talking to Councilman Lavelle, I know his priority is, number one, that that development goes up the hill, throughout the hill, so everybody, uh, you know, adva takes advantage of the, for the, the great, I think, development that's going to go on there. So, so what I will tell you today is this white councilman from the South Hills is in full support of Councilman Burgess and Mr. Lavelle, and you all here today. And uh, you can count on me, you know, to have your back as my brothers and sisters from the Hill always had mine. Thank you. Um, Councilman Deb Gross. 
Thank you, sir. And I wanted to reemphasize to thank all of the members who came out or all the participants who came out to testify and share your knowledge with us and, and with the public and also to the members of the audience who came out to spend their day um, learning and supporting um, the work on this issue. And of course, to the council members who introduced um, the legislation, Councilman Lavelle and Councilman Burgess. Um, so I want to um, acknowledge a few of the things that I heard that I think we as a body um, have heard the call to action to take action, right? And so we're looking for those actionable things. Um, and what I heard repeated over and over was not just the emphasis to focus on the intersections, right, the intersectionality, forgive me, um, so that we know through the Femisphere Project and through other testimony and so many panels that it's gender and class and classes, gender, race, and class, really they intersect so strongly. Um, and we saw that uh, dramatically in the presentations. Um, but also that the numbers really tell us that it's poverty and wealth disparity and wealth inequity that's really shaping so much of the outcomes that we're seeing. That's what I heard panel after panel, right? And I think this, that is the place we Please have be respectful. the capacity to take action. And so we've been looking through the work, again, as the council members of all and Burgess have emphasized on wage disparities, on affordable housing, and uh, look to where we can apply investment um, to counteract historic disinvestment. Um, and now, I mean, and I also want to say in having these panels here today, you know, we need to hold ourselves accountable and the public should hold us accountable to see improvements. We don't want to see this report being the same in the future. We want to see improved equity it is better for everyone in the city. Um, uh, so that, and I want to acknowledge also that we heard um, the very overwhelming number of 45% of African American children live in poverty in the city of Pittsburgh. All right, and and at least in this report, now we have it for just the city numbers. That's not the metro, that's not the county, that's not some other municipality, this is us. And we need to do better. We need to do better. So that is, let us change what we're doing, right? So we can get different outcomes. Um, and I, I wanna acknowledge also that we um, heard that childcare um, is one of the places that is a cost burden on so many families, um, African American families in the city of Pittsburgh. So we have, we shall commit to work on those issues. Thank you uh, for all your work. Thank you, Mr. Lavelle. Excuse me, thank you. Um, I'll be very brief. The, uh, Dr. Howe cited an example, and, and I don't, I'm not gonna get this verbatim, but essentially, she mentioned she used an example where black girls were less likely to take. I want to say it was algebra. Um, be, recommended be recommended for algebra, but when they actually took it, they did better than all their counterparts. I use that to simply say, we don't. We we should not be trying to fix the people. We have to fix the structural system that is not in allowing them to succeed and to improve. And that's a racist structure that we as collectively have to go about addressing. Um, I'll also echo your sentiments, Tim, which is you said this is not a black problem. This is an American problem. This is a Pittsburgh problem. And so when we have, it, have that understanding in that context to understand that to fix the structural, structurally racist system is to the benefit of all of us collectively, I think we can go about doing that work. Um, there is no city in America that is growing simply because white people do well. That's, right. That's not happening in our country. And despite all our accolades, this city, no, this city continues to lose population every year for over 30 years now. That means the city is actually dying despite our accolades. We can fix that 
by fixing the poor, the black and brown people who live in our city and lift them up. Um, with that being said, I do want to thank everyone who provided testimony today. Um, specifically, I don't want to mess her name up, Dr. Dara Mendez, um, you gave us eight recommendations. I certainly believe we can incorporate those recommendations as well as some that you made as well into our, our policy. Um, I think many of them go into separate pieces of the legislation, but they can certainly be incorporated. So I thank you and we certainly look forward to working with you as we move towards actual policies that begin to fundamentally change this. Um, and absolutely we will do it with you, not, it, not for you. It'll be with you, okay? All right, the point was heard. Thank you very much, uh, Councilwoman Harris. Yes, um, I, I would like to get uh, all the papers that um, we've seen today and I was very interested in Dr. I can't remember his name. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Rob one? Squid's name, Squid's name, Joe. Oh, okay. And uh, the life expectancy of the neighborhoods. Um, my neighborhood's below Homewood on here. And I was raised there since I'm three and still live there. And um, I would say it's mostly African American, but some of, some of us white kids grew up very, very poor too. I don't wanna see anybody go through the cracks, but you go out there and, and you look at this and you go out and see the neighborhoods and it looks exactly like what you're seeing here. Really, it is. And it, it's time to start doing in those neighborhoods. I mean, we get the CDBG dollars. You can't use CDBG dollars uh, in CDBG neighborhoods and just use the other money in regular neighborhoods. That's supposed to be extra for the poor neighborhoods to get things done. I do know that. That's correct. And uh, it hasn't happened. And until things like it start happening, it's going to stay the same. And it's not right. It is, I mean, from the time we went out and looked at the neighborhoods when Doug Shields was president, and what they look like, and there's some out in your area, um, in Deb's area. Uh, I, I still haven't seen much difference in those neighborhoods. I see more going on in the rich and less still going on in the poor. That's what's gotta change. We gotta start making sure that the children are growing up and having the ball fields and and getting people to fund them, um, not just for the sports, but any activity. Uh, like I've said since I've come here, uh, Pittsburgh Public Schools used to open the schools up at night and the city of Pittsburgh paid for the people to be there. And they learned a lot. And one of the things, um, as I was coming back, that, that I heard uh, uh, Councilman Coghill say was about the trades. And do you know, I put, when I was on Pittsburgh School Board, I put the implementation in for the Pittsburgh public school children to get into the trades. It's all sitting there, you, you can see it, but nobody wrote the policies yet to, to have that fulfilled. And, and that's sad, that's sad. That should have been done right after the legislation was done. But um, I'm happy to work with Tim and Anybody in this room, whether I'm on council or I'm not on council, I, I've done it for 45 years and I'm not gonna stop yet. 
not that old yet. <laughs> so, um, uh, I've worked with the Rev, and I've worked with um, Daniel in the neighborhoods, and uh, Daniel has a little part of the north side. I tease him about that, but um, you know I'm happy to work with and to try to get something done because you can't just keep coming and bringing people to the table and nothing's happening. It has to happen. Thank you, and thank you for all being here and staying. I want to um, finally, first of all, I want to thank all of the panel participants um, for their important insight. I want to thank all of you who have come and participated and been audience. I want to thank in advance those who will be there tonight at 6.30, it will be a long day, probably 40 or 50 people now have signed up and so it will be a moment. Um, I want to um, thank the All In Coalition and those members who are still here um, I want to particularly thank Kelly Seaborn Ware, who has coordinated this post agenda. Raise your hand, Kelly, and has who is uh, councils. She is councils policy and equity uh, analyst, uh, full time position lawyer, and um, um, has brought a level of expertise to this work for us. Um, I want to thank my council members of council. Um, I think um, seven members of council have participated on a Thursday, not their normal day to be in the building. And so we are grateful for your participation and to be a part of this, because to do this, it will take all of us working together. Um, I do understand that you're going to hear some pain, um, both today and tonight, you're going to hear sometimes when people cry out, it's because they're in pain. And when they're in pain, they're going to cry out. I hear that. I, am, I have spent my entire career, I have spent my entire career working in Homewood. I have lived, I, I have passed a church one block from where I was born and raised. I live three blocks from that place now. I have spent my entire life raising my family and now serving on council and teaching in college in that same place. And um, my children are almost grown. My daughter's a senior in college. I have three sons, all undergrad, two have graduates, two are doing active or full-time PhD students. My children are doing okay. But, but I have eight grand nieces and nephews who are between four and 10 years old. And I was, I was sitting at home once, you know, on a Friday, and they were not there. And my wife and I decided to go get them on a, you know, we get them at least once a month for the weekend, sometimes twice a month. Um, although I have kids in the church, my really point is the work doesn't stop. Even when your kids have made it, it hasn't, it is not enough. As long as there's these children growing up in poverty, without access to health care, without a vision for a future, the work doesn't stop. The myth is that it is a problem in our community, that it's a Homewood problem, or that it's a Hill District problem, or that it's a black problem. If you take that bait, you lose. If you take that bait, you lose. This is not a Homewood problem. This is not a black people's problem. This is a city problem, and this is an American problem. And it will take all of us, every community, government, nonprofits, corporations, coming together and working together. Now, all of us have different lanes. There are those of us who do direct services, and I've done that work. I'm old, so some of you are old enough to remember, but I've done that work, right? I've, I was the director of education at the county jail. I, 
I ran out exit pieces. I've done that. I've run so social services. I've done that part, right? Some of that work is important. Then there are community-based organizations. I also ran a nonprofit for a while, and I've done that work too. That's important, right? Building communities, building doing individual work, that's right. Got to do that. But there's a third level that has to be addressed, which is the council's responsibility, and that is the structural policy. You can help people individually every day. We've been doing that, right, brother? We've been doing that. You can help build community groups. You can do that. But unless you set up policies that change the structure of our system, nothing will change. And that is what I'm at this table to do, right? To change the structure so that when I'm asleep every day, homework gets better. When, when I'm gone, homework gets better. And that takes us all working together. Councilman Lavelle, along with council, along with the black elected officials, we are going to now, this policy stuff on, this is the beginning of creating a years, years long process of creating <coughs> innovative policy which will drive resources to, 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 to change our city. We have this moment to do this, and again, I hear the pain. Um, I do hear the pain, and I'm so sorry. Yes, I actually do. And so, and so, and so, and so, and so, and so, I got it. And so as a result, we may disagree on, we may disagree, we may disagree, we must, we may, we may disagree on process, but now, but now, we should not disagree on product, yeah, on who we trying to help. We may disagree on how to help them, but we don't disagree on who to help. And so with that, I am thankful for all of your participation. Again, 6.30 tonight, a long night, we'll be at the Ebenezer Baptist Church for a public hearing. I look forward to seeing you there. Again, thank everybody for your participation. God bless you and good night. I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. 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 All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Opposed to his name, we are adjourned.